Shabbat Shalom. As you can tell, and they've already mentioned it several times, and uh, we'll say it again, that this is going to be a little bit different. Got some feedback back here, guys. Uh, a little bit of, a little different uh, service today. And I'm not going to keep you long. I'm not, I don't want to preach a really, I don't have a very long message. Uh, we're going to hear a lot of good stuff uh, over the next week, right? Beginning, uh, I think, Today, we've had some amazing, the presence of the Holy Spirit is definitely being felt in this room. And, uh, and then Wednesday of next week, we will all gather for the final feast of our fall feast uh, celebrations. And so you're going to be getting a lot of good stuff. And so I want to jump in. This is a, it is the holiest day in Israel. Now, I know we're very American. Right. And so for us to really grasp a hold of that, could you imagine for a moment with me if our entire nation, the United States, came to a place that celebrated this feast day and what that would look like in our nation as a whole? It would be powerful, wouldn't it? It's not just a holy nation because a nation does it. It's because of what happened, what this day signifies. And I'm just going to, just for the sake of going back and talking about some stuff, uh, just kind of rehash what this day means. You've heard a lot of it already. But it is a time of reflection. It's a time of repentance. It's a type of, it's a time of seeking reconciliation uh, with Yahweh. It's a time for us to kind of recenter, right? Sometimes, you know, life happens. And because life happens, we get, we get off-centered. We, we, we get into things, we do things that maybe are not pleasing to Yahweh or offend others or we offended or we become offended or we're the offender, whichever. But believers in Messiah Yeshua, believing that he is the Messiah, this day holds profound significance. Not only as a solemn observance, but also as a celebration of his divinity and his redemptive work. This is an amazing time when we sit back and think about it. We fast and we pray and we make this day like any other day or any other of the celebrations. This is the only day out of all the feasts where we are to afflict ourselves. This is the only day of the, the, the Moedim that we're commanded to keep where we are to afflict the soul. I know maybe like you, I, I'm not always the sharpest tool in the shed. And there are times where I just look at it and go, well, I don't understand how this can be called a feast day. When you think of the weight that this day actually carries. We get a good look about this affliction when we look in the book of Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, by every scholar, will tell you this is the first part of 58 of Isaiah, deals with Yom Kippur and deals with the fast of it. And many of you know this. We see what this fast is to look like and what it should be and how it should look in our hearts, and uh, let, me get my, let me go ahead and get that. Praise God. Are we there? Praise God. Isaiah 58 and 3 says, Why have we fasted? They're asking a question to Yahweh, yet you do not see. Why have we afflicted our souls, yet you take no notice? Behold, in the day of your fast, this is Yahweh talking, you seek your own pleasure and exploit all your labors. So, Isaiah gives us a glimpse of what a fast should look like. Now, I'm not, just for, so you don't check out on me, I'm, I'm not really going to deal with the fasting aspect of it. I, I just want to hit it for a second because there's a, there's a critical issue that we can see if we look into the context of what's being spoken here throughout the book of Isaiah 58 when we read that chapter. It is dealing with the attitude of a person's heart when they fast. I want to talk about that more later. Let me say this also at this, at, this, at this point. That we know basically from Scripture, and although we know from Scripture that, uh, that, a, that a biblical fast, right, is no food, no water. But I, I want to say something to that. Because of Isaiah 58, it really brings to light a, a, another truth that I think we can hang on to. It's not just about you fasting food and water. Because I know people, you may know people, we know a generation, we know a whole nation that is fasting today. 
and yet their hearts are far from Yahweh. So I think, I think what we have to understand is regardless of how you're fasting today, I talked to somebody there, and that's a tough one. They're, they're fasting from their cell phone. So some of y'all may take note to that. You may be fasting from social media, or maybe you're not in a place where you can fast a full meal and uh, water. That's not the issue. It's about your heart. And I want to say this, that wherever you are today, whatever you're fasting today, I do believe it pleases the Father when the heart is right. When the motivation behind it. Because you can keep Yom Kippur and you can fast Yom Kippur and you can be like, I'm no, no food, no water. Look at me. Woohoo! Great. How's your heart? How's your heart? And you see this, there's a theme, which is beautiful, that you see running through our community today. And it really is dealing with the object of our hearts today. So carrying on, let's continue on with what Scripture says about this. Uh, verse, he goes on, We have fasted, yet you do not see why we have afflicted our souls, yet you take no notice. Behold, in the day of your fast, what does it say? You seek your own pleasure. It's an attitude of the heart and exploit all your labors. So we go into Leviticus 23. Again, we've read this. You're going to hear it multiple times, I'm sure, throughout the next week and a half. However, in the 10th day of this month is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It's a holy convocation to you, so you are to afflict yourself. Now, no one in their right mind will live a life that wants to afflict. And when we see that, it, it brings a whole different type of like, scenarios of what does it mean to afflict our soul? What does it really look like? And then he says you're to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. The word afflict is uh, the really key words of this passage obviously are two words. It's the word holy, which is the word kodesh, and the word afflict. The word afflict is a word in Hebrew, ana, and it means to suffer affliction. But it also means, in another sense, in the, in the lighter sense of the word, it means to humble yourself. So that's why I think, man, whatever you're doing today is Yom Kippur that's causing you, that will cause you to say, wait a minute, this is not about me. That's probably the most important thing we can pick up from this thief day, is that today is not about you. It's not about a celebration of your life and, and everything that you've accomplished and your knowledge and your wisdom and your discernment and any of that. It's not a celebration of you of how long you've been a Christian or how many Bible verses you know. This is about humbling ourselves, And to do that, when we look through Scripture, we see Scripture after Scripture, one of the ways we do that is through fasting. Again, whatever that fast may look like for you. So we look over, going down to the next verse, verse 28. It says, you're not to do any kind of work on that set day, for it is Yom Kippur. Now, we're blessed in this point, this, this year, because it, a lot of our feast days are landing on Shabbat. So for that, we have a double Sabbath today, basically. It's really what it is. So if anything, I hope and I pray that you're not working. Because what he says about that, he says, if you do work, can you imagine what he's saying? You'll be cut off. Pastor Mike, why are you being so hard? Just for a second, okay? Just for a moment. I want you to understand this. For Yom Kippur, it was to make atonement for you. This is a holy day, not because there's a gentleman that's going into the temple, but because there is someone in the heavenly temple. That is right now, listen, right now he is making intercession for you. All the scriptures that we read and kind of the conviction that we felt this morning, man, I want you to grab this, that, that there is an intercessor right now making intercession for you. Amen. Thank you. Kapar or Kapor is where we get this term, yom, yom being a day or Kapor. Kapor in Hebrew meaning the day of atonement or atonement. This is what we're doing. This is why I believe Yahweh. I believe one of the reasons why it's still in this place, like why it's here and why we're celebrating it as, as Christians. It's not necessarily because we have someone going in in human form it's because I believe Yahweh wants us to remember what has been done for us. That's why it's a holy day. As followers of Messiah, this should resonate with us. For Yeshua, our Messiah, had done just that. He removed, what does he do? From the old temple, in the temple, when the earthly temple was here, 
the, the, the Kohen Gadol of the time would, would dis, disrobe his priestly robes. All the beautiful jewels that were the gold trim, all of it. And he would take it off and he would put on just a plain cloth. Many believe that it was white. Why many here wear white today? That reason and the reason of signifying our purity in Messiah. But we have a Messiah who did that. He literally removed his garments and put on earthly garments. Atonement. Our atonement had been made through Messiah. We continue on through understanding this verse. You shall do no work. We've read this. It is a state statue forever throughout your generation and all your dwellings. It is to be a Shabbat, a solemn rest, and you're to humble your souls. And as we've read already on the ninth day of the month in the evening, from evening until evening, you're to keep your Shabbat. You shall do no kind of work. It is a statue forever throughout the generations. It is to be a Shabbat, shalom, uh, Shabbat of solemn rest. You are to humble your soul. Pardon me, I'm behind a little bit. There we go. It's what happens when you're fasting coffee. Amen. So, and we all can relate, right? But this is what Yom Kippur, this is, this, is the, this is why I love Yom Kippur. It is one of my favorite, favorite days. And I know that kind of sounds weird, but because it, it, it puts me back in alignment. It puts me back into alignment. It reminds me of what really is important as a follower of Messiah. We see something here in ret- when we look at what has been done for us in this holy day. Most of us would agree that our atonement has been made by Yeshua. At least I hope you would. And if you do not believe that, by the time you leave, I hope that it, that is the case. That you believe that, as it's stated already, that the lamb sacrifice has been made. And we all had a part, we all participated in that. What a great Torah portion. Have we ever stopped to think about that on Yom Kippur? That we all had a part in the crucifixion of Messiah. Even if your sin was only the sin of a thimbleful or just a little, a little squirt bottle thing that you can just drop a couple drops in it, you still had a part in playing with his crucifixion. But yet our redemption, nobody in here has had a part in that but one. So as we face this day, it's a time of retrospection. Have I offended anyone? Is there unrepentant sin? Is Yeshua truly my Lord and my Savior? Yeshua himself said this. This is why I think Yom Kippur is so vital. That John 12, 24. Yeshua says, Amen, amen, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it forever. I mean, isn't that really what's happening here on Yom Kippur? Like when we fast, we're telling the flesh, no. We're dying to self. We're not going to allow that because Messiah told us, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Which means that the flesh has to die. This is to me, this passage here is really what Yom Kippur is. It reminds me that if I'm going to die, I must die in the flesh. I must die to self. And what's crazy about it, and what's the part because we're just human, is it's not a one-time event. Dying to self, for some of us, is a regular, sometimes weekly, sometimes daily, and yes, there are some that sometimes it's hourly that we have to die to self. See, as long as we live in this earth suit and as long as we live on this rock, you and I are going to have significant opportunities of offense, of anger, strife, bitterness, jealousy, wrath, rebellion. Fill in your thing until that day, praise Yahweh, when everything changes. But until then, Yom Kippur is a very much needed 
feast day of Yahweh's. See, what Messiah says in John was both a prophetic, it was prophetic of Messiah and instructional for us. Yeshua would die and would produce fruit. That's you and me. But for us, we are continually dying, at least we should be, to become more and more like him. This self-examination should lead us closer to Messiah. Yom Kippur is not a means of exaltation because you fasted, and maybe someone didn't. Something that we really should be guarding against. I heard recently from a teacher that I, 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 I one of the teachers I like to follow in, of Torah saying about the feast days that we should guard our hearts as followers of Christ. And we guard our hearts from looking down upon others who may not have received the understanding of Torah or may not even be celebrating Yom Kippur today. For that's pride in and of itself. See, Yom Kippur is not what everybody else is doing. Yom Kippur is what am I doing? What does his atonement mean for me? What does atonement mean for you? For your walk? Who God has called you to be? See, a person can fast today and not have one single thought of Yeshua. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what's happening right now. Across this globe, there are men and women and children who are fasting for Yom Kippur and they will never have one inkling thought of Christ. We shall not confuse it. This day is all about Yeshua, for it is only through Yeshua that our sins can be atoned for. No amount of fasting makes a man holy or blames or blameless before Yahweh, who judges the living and the dead. This is why I want to focus today not just about Yom Kippur and how we should do Yom Kippur, I want a main focus to be on our attention to go to the Messiah. I want our attention to focus him today. So I want to kind of turn the service a little bit. And I want to talk about Yeshua and why this is such a remarkable feast day when we let Yeshua be at the center of it. Fulfillment of the law. Yeshua's life and ministry exemplified the perfect fulfillment of the law. He embodies the principles of Yom Kippur, bringing a new understanding of what atonement really looks like. Instead of a yearly ritual where the high priest would continue to go into the Holy of Holies, releasing the scapegoat for the nation of Israel, now Messiah's sacrifice provides a continual path of reconciliation with Yahweh. In the book of Hebrews, Yeshua is portrayed as our great high priest, the Kohen Gadol, who intercedes for us. His role surpasses the earthly priest as he not only offers a sacrifice, but is the sacrifice. This reinforces his divine nature and the depth of his love for humanity. If you wanted a picture of what real love looked like, today is that day. No wonder why we should look at it and value it as the most holy days because Yahweh's love is on display in the Day of Atonement. This truly is the love of God. That he would come down to make a sacrifice for his creation. I mean, even in the term Emmanuel, God is with us. One may, think, may not even think when we come to Yom Kippur that where would you come? That's a Christmas thing, isn't it? We would never think about Yom Kippur and think of Emmanuel. One may not think of that. But for me, I can't help it. I can't help but not think of Emmanuel. Everything that I am today, everything that you are today, is because the God of all creation the one who placed every star in its rightful place and the one who came to earth in the form of a man went into the Holy of Holies for our final time. Perfect, sinless. This is Emmanuel. This is Yahweh, God with us. 
There's a fundamental truth that when we begin to look at the deity of Messiah, and that is this, no person can in any way, in every way, understand the essential character of God. And this characteristic that I'm about to bring to you, no man on earth can fully explain the mystery of Yahweh, Elohim, the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When we try to, we will always come up short. When we try to put something in our own box for our own understanding with our finite mind, how dare us to try to understand the mind of Yahweh? But yet there's great debates. Did Yahweh come in the flesh to die for us? Well, let's read. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 says, Rather we speak Yahweh's wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom that has been hidden, which God dis- destined for our glory before the ages. Which God destined for our glory before the ages. None of the rulers, watch this, of this age understood it. Now, I want you to think about that statement for a moment. I want you to think of the thousands and thousands of years of Jewish tradition and rabbinical and the protection of scripture and scribes and scrolls that have been written in the knowledge and the wisdom of the world until you, you individually, please, me, came to understand Yeshua. None of the rulers of this age could understand it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, as it is written, things no eye has seen, no ear has heard, they have not entered the heart of mankind. These things God has prepared for those who love him. We cannot fathom in our finite minds the completeness and the wholeness of Elohim. And when we try to do it, we will always, church, we will always come up short. Yom Kippur gives us just a glimpse, doesn't it? Just a little bitty look when we see what he is doing and what he has done. He is our Kohen Gadol. He is our high priest. Yom Kippur was the only day that the high priest took off those beautiful garments that I mentioned earlier. In Hebrews 4, we see this. Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol, I want to pause there for a moment because as I've been studying this, and there's probably a lot more to put in there, there is, as I've been thinking about this, my mind, man, has just been blown away. I talked to Scott about it. I've talked to several people about it. I want you to think about this for a moment, that there is a religion, a whole nation of people, this is heavy if you really get in your spirit this morning, who do not have a Kohen Gadol. I want you to think about that. They don't have a priesthood. Matter of fact, historically, it says that when the temple was destroyed, when they would try to try to light or ignite the menorah, it would go out because they rejected the true Kohen Gadol when they would pull out the strings that they tied and pick the goat, that it was supposed to turn crimson, it would not turn crimson after the temple was destroyed because the rejection of the Kohen Gadol, the great high priest, Messiah Yeshua. That's, I don't know who just said that, but you're absolutely right. That is, that is hard. That's powerful. Yet we have one. The joy that comes with Cohen, with Yom Kippur, is that we have a high priest. We have someone who is making intercession for us. We have someone who made the atonement, who took upon your sin, my sin, and paid the ultimate price so that you and I would not have to. Who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua ben Elohim, son of God, let us hold firmly to our confessed allegiance. Mm. For we do not have a Kohen Gadol who is un, unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all the same ways, yet is without sin. Amen. Therefore, 
I love the therefores, don't you? Like, I love the therefores when they come into play. Like, like because of all of this, this is what you're going to get. It's almost like there's a promise coming. Let us draw near to the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help in a time of need. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Yeshua. He's worthy of praise, isn't he? He's worthy of all glory. You and I, because of the great atonement of our Kohen Gadol, we now can approach the throne of grace. Boldly. Thank you, brother. Boldly. Hallelujah. Ordinarily, the high priest's outfit was something of dazzling splendor. There were bright colors and a breastplate of precious stone. But on Yom Kippur, this day, the high priest was required to take off these glorious robes in exchange for simple white linen garments in order to go into the Holy of Holies. Leviticus 16 and 3. In this way shall Aaron come into the sanctuary with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on a holy linen garment. Have the linen garment on his body. Put on the linen sash and wear the linen turban. They are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and put them on. It's powerful. Ramban, many of you are familiar with some of his writings, a Jewish sage, suggested it was reminiscent of a serving angel and that the purity of the simple white material symbolized the holiness of the day. And that's why traditionally we put on white. It's just to symbolize how holy this day really means to us as followers of Messiah. I know it's traditional. So if you're wearing it, great. If you're not, great. Praise the Lord. Right? Because it's not what we put on that makes us righteous. Come on, somebody. But it is tradition. Now, let's look at some stuff here that's just... This is awesome. For it was Yahweh who promised that he would save us, that he would send the deliverer. Who knew it would be himself? God in the flesh? Now, now I'm a simple-minded guy. So this, this fascinates me. It fascinates me and causes us to look at Messiah from a completely different lens. That our Elohim, our God, Yah, that some of you say, could make himself man in order to die so that our relationship with him would be restored. How many do we know, any other gods that we know that would ever do such a thing? None. So let's look. Let's watch, watch what this does. This is so cool. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah is one of my favorite books, by the way. Isaiah 43 and 3. What's he say? For I am Adonai, your God. Who's speaking? God, Yahweh, somebody just said, the Holy One of Israel, what? Your Savior. I've given Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Theba in your place. Jumping down to verse 11. I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Wait a minute now, Mike. This sounds like you may be talking about that Yeshua... And his deity. I am. This is why I love Yom Kippur. How holy of a time this is. See, this conversation that we're seeing in the book of Isaiah, the prophet, this sounds like Jesus to me. It sounds exactly like Yeshua the Messiah, the word of Messiah that we'll look at here in a minute. And it doesn't end there. Like, this is a great study to do on your own. We'll go to Isaiah 43 and 15. It says, I am the Lord, your Holy One. The what? Creator of Israel. The creator of Israel. Who created Israel? I believe it was Yahweh. But it doesn't end there. If you have your Bible, you know there's something missing. Your king. Who is our king? Who is this king in Isaiah 43 that he could possibly be talking about? Well, Psalms answers the question for us. When we look at Psalms, chapter 24, beginning in verse 8. Who is this king of glory? Adonai, strong and mighty. Adonai, mighty 
in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Adonai Travot. He is the King of glory. This is so powerful, church. Can you imagine for a moment, Yahweh, your Father in heaven, has a love for His people, and He wants to restore relationship so desperate that He wants this relationship restored, that He becomes one of you. Perfect. Perfect. Without sin. Showing what it's really all about, which is love. Okay, Pastor Mike, that's not enough for me. I'm still not convinced. Thus says Adonai, Israel's king and his redeemer, Adonai Travot, I am the first. I am the last. <laughs> I've heard this somewhere. <laughs> and there is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and announce it. Let him arrange it in order of me or for me as I establish the ancient nation. Let them declare to them what is coming in future events. In other words, he's the beginning and the end. He knows everything. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And he's telling them, well, if there's some other God out there, someone that you believe, let them tell you what the future holds for you. That's powerful, man. You know, all right, Pastor Mike, that's all, the, that's all that Tanakh and that Old Testament stuff. Let's go to Matthew 2, chapter 2. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship. This is the New Testament. What I love about it is the very beginning of the New Testament, and it establishes who your king is. Did we miss that? I don't. I think I'm preaching better than you're talking. There is no God beside me who is like me. Let him proclaim and announce it. Israel's king. Come on, somebody. Listen to this. King of the Jews. I'm just going to walk through Scripture and we'll wrap it up here. 1 Timothy 3.16. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 6.13. I charge you before Yahweh, who gives life to all things, and Messiah Yeshua, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of your Lord Yeshua the Messiah. This he will reveal in his own time, and blessed and only ruler, King of kings, Lord of lords. See, what we see in Isaiah is what we're seeing in the New Testament. This is why I'm very adamant about not cherry-picking scriptures, where we pull one scripture out to try to defend your case. Okay, you can't do that. You have to take the totality of scripture from all sources in the Bible to, in, in, to bring doctrine. This is where confusion can happen because we bring eisegesis into Scripture. And, and, and really, eisegesis just simply means that you put your own uh, bias, you put your own belief system into what you're reading, and that's how you decipher it, where that's not accurate. Because if, especially if we're sinful people, we have to be led by the Holy Spirit and exegesis. Exegesis means you read the text what the text says. You don't put in something that's not there. You simply read the text. And that's what we're seeing right now. See, what does that have to do with the, about Yom Kippur? Everything. Everything. Why is it holy? Oh my goodness. Yeshua, our Messiah, paid the price. Now most of you will know this next text that I'm going to read to you. You'll be like, okay, this is an elementary one. I just thought for fun we'd bring it up. In the beginning, let me back up there. In the beginning was the Word. 
the Word was with God. Why is that not highlighted? Praise the Lord. Sorry, guys. I apologize. That should have been highlighted. There we go. The Word was with God, and the Word... Wait a second. Wait a second. If, if the Word was with God, how can the Word be God? If Yeshua is the Word, He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through Him, and apart from Him, nothing was made. If I could drop a mic, I'd do it right here. Because it just makes sense. That has come into being. This is powerful. This is why I love Yom Kippur. This is why I'm hoping that when you see Yom Kippur, you will look at it from a different lens. You'll see it through the eyes of Yahweh. Making us holy because he went in. He is the Kohen uh, uh, Gadol. Sorry that. Haven't had anything to drink in a minute. No coffee. We cannot be any clearer. When it comes to the deity of Messiah, we see this in 1 John. It's very clear. Isaiah, very clear. Throughout Scripture, very clear. And then we see this, almost this image of Kohen Gadol unfold like we just read about when we look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, who, though existing in the form of God, did not consider being equal to God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, becoming the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Sometimes when I talk to people about fasting, and this is in no way, a, 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 you know, I don't believe in fasting. I'm like, if anything, we should humble ourselves because Messiah did. That's all. Whatever that looks like for you. This is one of those amazing and confounding ideas for us to truly grasp the identity of Elohim. Is so, it's so mind-boggling for us. And I think on this day, a day of humbling, it would be good for us to just go, you know what? I don't know all things. I don't know everything. I cannot understand nor grasp the infinite wisdom of Yahweh and how he did things. I can't understand that. Maybe set the pride down a little bit and bring in the humility and say, Yahweh, whatever I'm lacking and wherever I'm lacking, would you fill in the void? And you know something? You may get that here. Or it may wait until you talk to Jesus face to face. Paul really spoke to this in Romans 11.33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how incomprehensible his ways. For who has known the mind of Adonai or who has been his counselor or who has first given to him that he shall be repaid, that should be repaid to him? For from him, I know I'm missing a bunch of highlights, guys. I apologize. Uh, there we go. Wisdom and knowledge. There you go. Praise the Lord. Unsearchable, incomprehensible. There we go. All right. Good stuff. Or who has first given to him that it shall be repaid to him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This term, I'm going to back up to it here real quick. Yeah, look, here we go. This term right here, incomprehensible, it's a fascinating word. It literally means beyond, listen, beyond finding out. Beyond finding out. Can I just settle maybe some theological disputes today? There are some things you're just not going to understand. There are some things that are just not in our earthly finite mind you're simply not going to understand. You just aren't. And those people who act as if they do and have this wisdom, can I, can I just give you some, some pastoral love and wisdom? Run. Run. They're not good people. powerful. This is humbling for us, or at least it should be, that we cannot understand how all of this happens and how all of this is. 
the pride that we could think that we could completely understand who he is and how he does anything is mind-blowing. Mind blowing. Yom Kippur can be a time of great humility, especially by taking our focus off of everything except that of Yeshua. In the heart of a believer, Yom Kippur transcends a day of solemnity. It becomes a profound opportunity to reflect on the significance of Yeshua's atoning work by embracing both the gravity of sin and the joy of redemption, believers can celebrate his deity, acknowledging him as God, who desires a relationship with his people. I want to wrap up with this thought right here. We've already kind of picked on this, but I thought for fun we would bring it out. My front row guys have already kind of uh, allured to it. Revelation 22 and 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and I am the last. I am the beginning, and I am the end. Listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I called. I am he. I am the first, and I'm also the last. Can we see how amazing today really is? Can we see that maybe you came in today and you kind of had this Jewish understanding of like, well, I'm not Jewish, and yet we're doing, why are we doing Yom Kippur? I hope today... As we wrap this up today, as we pray and we worship some more, that you really appreciate Yom Kippur and what it's really about. We've been atoned for. Our sins, our unfaithfulness, all that stuff. But as I said, I want us to see God. I want us to see the Elohim. I want us to understand that this lamb that died, that this high priest that continues to make intercession for us, that his death was not just a one-time deal. Come on up, guys. It wasn't just a one-time deal. It's happening over and over and over again. For anyone who will repent, turn from sin, and turn back to Yeshua, their sins will be forgiven. This Yom Kippur may be a time of deep reflection, heartfelt repentance, and a joyful celebration of the grace found in Yeshua, the Messiah and High Priest. Let's take the rest of this time today to come before Him with a true heart of worship, laying down our sins, our pride, our false sense of wisdom, and come before him, bowing if needed, for the king is coming. The bridegroom has sent his invitation for all of us to join him. Blessings to you guys.